You have heard stories about a wizard named Merlin, whose last service to England kind was to teach a brave man to become a wise king with the aid of a sword named Excalibur. In truth, Merlin lives even today, serving kings and queens of many countries, but his name and appearance have changed much since the tale of the sword and the stone. Today, if you glimpsed Merlin strolling down a sidewalk downtown, he would resemble a kindly middle-aged golfer or a shrewd software genius, or a banker, or a surgeon. This is because wizards like Merlin do not grow old as time flows by. They grow young. And for them, time flows very slowly. Every year in a regular person's life feels like just a few minutes to a wizard. Eventually, Merlin, like all wizards, will become young and strong, with bulging muscles, rosy cheeks, a set of straight white teeth and a full head of lustrous hair. Even further downstream, he will start to shrink, get plump, and become a baby. At the end of his life, far, far in the future, beyond a time that we can imagine, he will become so small that he will slip between the cracks of the earth and return to the womb from which he came. And that's where we start this story, in the womb of the earth. Merlin was born not in human form, but as a rocky island many leagues north of us near the cold, mist-shrouded shores of Scandinavia. He spent his first few moments of life covered in a dense, heavy blanket of ice. He was newly born, so even he cannot count how many moments he lived at the bottom of a glacier. But finally he began to see the sun, and his rocky, barren face grew warm in the fresh air. Many ages passed as salty surf splashed on all sides of him. Lichen grew on his jagged shoreline boulders, and moss crept between the fissures of the stone further inland. Slowly, grass and trees grew on Merlin's skin, and after animals began visiting the lush little island, Merlin began to think thoughts. Before this, Merlin merely lived his life as an island, and he was somewhat content. But in the core of his body, where different densities of basalt slowly shifted against each other, he had begun to feel a spark of something growing. What this something was, he could not determine. It felt like an object, but it was not a crystal, or a mineral, or a plant, or an animal. Deep in the center of his body, Merlin pondered the meaning and identity of this thing, which was certainly part of him, but felt like something completely alien. As eagles sang in his trees, walruses slapped on flat stones of his shores, Bees pollinated his flowers, and beetles rolled bits of goo along his soil. Merlin turned his mind inward. Over the eons, he had used his island ears to hearken to the whistling air and crashing surf. But now those same ears began to hear a new sound. And the new sound came from the mysterious object inside of him. And the thing which spoke to him was called a thought. As soon as Merlin heard the object's voice, he recognized the language and knew that this was his very own language. The crackling feeling inside of him spoke the language of the rock and the sea, and it was expressing a thought. And immediately, that thought became a thing, which had not existed in the world before. This was the very first day that Merlin thought a thought, and after that, he was not interested in being just an island made of stone surrounded by the cold, salty ocean covered by plants and animals. He wanted to become someone who could move about the world and think more thoughts and make the thoughts become things. So it was that, as other islands and mountains around the planet shifted in their own ways, moving from here to there, growing larger or smaller, dividing or combining, Merlin shrunk to the size of a human being. And became like a man. It was a peculiar sort of transformation, starting as an island and becoming a man. That spark of thought crackling within him guided his change as naturally as a caterpillar becomes a butterfly or a tadpole becomes a frog. He might have become a seal or a gull had the spark led him in a different direction, but 
His search for knowledge and his desire for control led him to adopt the shape of a human. Indeed, other wizards started their lives on Earth as other things, but that same urge propelled them all toward humanity. Merlin's path began in the sea. His island body grew smaller year by year. The animals and vegetation left their homes for other islands. Bit by bit, the rocks disappeared from above the waves, and Merlin receded to the sea floor, where currents whisked away the last of the extra rock. Over many years, the gentle eddies and deep sea whirlpools carved out a human body, slowly forming legs and arms, a belly, a head, and all the other parts that make up a man. Finally, the current eroded the last of the bedrock that held him to the ocean floor, and he was able to stand on his legs. When he emerged from the surf to walk upon the dry shore, he was still mostly of the sea. His flesh was tough and gray like a shark's. His back was crooked and bent like a log of driftwood, and the long white locks that hung from his head and chin resembled kelp more than hair. The tangled mane was so long that it fell all the way to his feet, covering him completely the way seaweed covers a shoreline boulder. As he hobbled along the rocky shore, wide gray sea to one side and deep purple forest on the other, he approached a creek that quietly emptied into the ocean. In the shallows, where the creek mixed with ocean water, a bear was fishing. Having never seen a bear before, Merlin counted the arms and legs, noted the length of the torso and rounded skull, and guessed that it was merely a shaggy human. The bear raised his head and glanced at Merlin, scanned the rest of the shore, and then returned its attention to the water. Merlin shuffled across the wave-worn stones and called out to the bear, Hello, sir! The bear ignored him. Beneath the surface of the water, a salmon was trying to slip past the bear's paws to access the warm, fresh water of the creek. The bear used his keen eyes to follow every slight movement through the rippling water. Talking to this old seaborne man was not a high priority. Convinced that the bear simply did not hear him, Merlin straightened his back and cleared his rattling throat. Excuse me, sir. I do not mean to bother you. I have newly arrived on this shore, and I am seeking the company of other men. The bear's ears twitched as its attention was divided between the old man's raspy voice and the slurp of water between his paws. The notion that Merlin had mistaken it for a man was so strange that it momentarily lost track of the salmon. In that instant, the fish wriggled under his body and sped up into the creek, disappearing amid the boulders and weeds. Disgusted, the bear turned its great bulky body to Merlin and said, I am a bear, silly man. A hungry bear who just lost his breakfast thanks to you. A bear? You look so much like me. If you are looking for creatures that share your appearance, you will need to travel far, far south. The bear stood on its hind legs, revealing its broad chest and round belly and pointed down the shoreline with its curved claw. Now leave me to my fishing, it snorted, and returned its gaze to the water, searching for a glint of scales beneath the flashing waves. I am grateful to your assistance, bear. Merlin felt a smile crackling his cheeks. Allow me to help you. He cast his mind into the stream where the fugitive fish had escaped. He wove his mind into a net and captured the salmon then dragged it downstream into the ocean where the bear stood. With his mind, Merlin instructed the salmon to submit to the bear, so the fish simply jumped out of the water and into the bear's mouth, dying peacefully in the middle of the air. Without pausing, Merlin waded across the softly gurgling creek and continued south toward the dwelling place of men. The bear muttered its stunned gratitude through a mouthful of salmon as Merlin walked away. He was pleased with himself for learning so much from his first conversation as a man, but he still felt that sparkling itch churning within him, urging him that there was much more to know about this world now that he stood on two feet. As he walked, he pondered the dual mystery of what more he must know and what was goading him to search for this elusive knowledge. In his mind's eye, he pictured a sparkling gem embedded deep within his body, some sort of glittering, energetic stone that glowed with a life all its own. He still felt that his body was mostly earth and rock, composed of the same elements as it was when he first heard the call of his heart gem. Now, at least in human form, 
he could heed its call more actively. As he listened, he trekked south and east, away from the misty rocky shores of Scandinavia, deep into the damp black forests that covered the hills and valleys of northern Europe. He walked very slowly, because his stiff rocky legs had not yet warmed into real human flesh. Whenever he approached a steep embankment, his steps would shorten to a few inches, and it would take several days to cross a ravine, and he would often stumble because his joints were not yet flexible enough to balance on this uneven ground. After many tumbles, Merlin decided he would need some assistance. He had tried to use fallen branches as crutches, but they all broke under the weight of his heavy body. He knew the branches of living trees would bear much more weight than dead ones, and he admired the strength and beauty of the hawthorn. So one day, he found a particularly graceful hawthorn growing by itself in a glen, and he sat beneath it and composed a little song. The song had no words, but the tune went like this. When he sang the song, he imagined a stone which was small enough to fit in the palm of his hand, with twenty blue rays extending from its center so that it looked like a star. Somehow this bluish gem symbolized the tree in Merlin's mind, and the song reached out to the living heart gem of the hawthorn tree. When he finished singing, his eyes fell upon a bed of moss between two roots, and there, twinkling in the daylight, was the very gem he had imagined. He lifted the gem to look more closely at it, and as he gazed into its multiple facets, the gem's beauty filled him with such awe that he cried his first tears. The tears dropped onto the gem, and it began to glow brightly. Instantly, as if the tree had been waiting for a cue, one branch bent down and touched Merlin's shoulder. He quickly stood up in surprise, because even the lowest branches of this mighty tree grew far above his head. But one of them, stretched down and offered its leafy hand to him. When he reached up to grasp the end of the branch, it detached itself from the trunk and fell gently into his arms. He held the base of the branch in one hand and the gem in the other near its leafy end. The stems reached out and plucked the gem from his hand, enclosing it tightly like fingers clasping into a fist, and immediately it was nested in the tip of this beautiful straight branch. Merlin beheld the branch gratefully, and knew that this was a living branch offered to him by the hawthorn tree. It was the perfect size for a staff, and when he leaned on it, he felt its strength. Nothing would break this staff, not rocks, nor lightning, or fall from great height. This would be his staff. He held it high and swung it round, testing its weight and balance. He still stood close to the tree, so accidentally he knocked the gem, which was held tight in the staff's grasp against the trunk of the hawthorn tree. Instantly, he felt the life of the tree flowing into his heart, and it sent a message to him. Behold, the gift of the hawthorn. Place any gem in its grip, wrap it once, and you will access its power. As he listened to the message flowing to him from the tree, he felt a curious tingling in his limbs. He looked down and saw that his flesh was glowing with life. The power of the hawthorn heart gem was strong, flexible limbs. Just as the branch of a tree will swing and bend in a storm without breaking, so his arms and legs had lost all their rocky brittleness. He was still very old and unsteady on his feet, recall that wizards age backwards, but he knew somehow he had become a little bit more like a human. He laughed joyfully. He had discovered the power that gems hold and how to access that power. So now, He reasoned that all he would need to do is find the gem that held that knowledge. 